Understanding Reporting Bias. Randomised control trials and systematic reviews are used by both clinicians and policymakers to make decisions about the treatment or prevention of health problems and to develop evidence-based guidelines in public health. Evidence-based medicine is the cornerstone of clinical practice, but it's dependent on the quality of evidence upon which it's based. Today we'll focus our attention on reporting bias, which is a threat to the validity and quality of evidence, and we'll take a look at its impacts. Reporting bias is an umbrella term that encompasses a range of different types of biases. And it's also been described as the most significant form of scientific misconduct. So what exactly is reporting bias? Porter of the Dictionary of Epidemiology defines reporting bias as the selective revelation or suppression of information or of study results that often occurs when the dissemination of research findings is influenced by the nature and direction of the results themselves. What are the factors? Annie Vanderstein and colleagues developed a theoretical framework which aims to explain potential causal pathways that lead to reporting bias. These causal pathways may derive from pressures from society and science, which can impact on the motivations of researchers and may also create conflicts of interest between different stakeholders in the research. Both are then translated into the practical application of the research via the competing motivations of researchers, stakeholders and interested parties, as well as within the means and methods that they choose to employ during the study life cycle, and thus leading to reporting bias. Richards and Onokpoya highlighted that various forms of conscious and unconscious reporting biases affect every stage during the life cycle of research from the pre-study conceptualization and design phase via under-reporting or not reporting of methods and outcomes, to the data collection and analysis throughout the study, and the post-study interpretation, dissemination, and publication phase, such as selectively reporting outcomes, all of which may produce misleading positive findings and creates falsehoods that are difficult to correct post hoc. For example, Authors may use harking or hypothesizing after the results are known, or may completely falsify published data when facing statistically insignificant or contradicting results. Time lag bias might occur if a rushed or delayed publication of a study influenced a meta-analysis because a researcher's journal of preference rejected their paper. Some researchers may publish to many journals to increase their exposure, but this of course increases the likelihood of duplication bias and the trial being included multiple times in a meta-analysis. Some may not publish their research at all as 50% of randomized control trials go unpublished. Sponsors on the other hand that fund trials like pharmaceutical companies or private companies whose interest may be to hide negative findings from the public may deliberately obstruct the dissemination of research results and therefore are less likely to be published compared to academy funded trials. Editor, editors favor positive or statistically significant findings because positive results lead to more citations and potential media attention, and so the cycle continues. In fact, the proportion of positive results in scientific literature has increased significantly and is a constant across most countries and disciplines. The impact of reporting bias is that study effects may be overrated. Neglect of negative or null data results creates an incomplete data set, exaggerating the importance of a phenomenon. Underreporting of negative results introduces bias into meta-analysis, which consequently misinforms researchers, doctors and policymakers. Resources go potentially wasted on already disputed unpublished research that's unavailable to the scientific community. And in trials with human subjects, we must consider that people gave their time and exposed themselves to risk with the assurance that the study will be of benefit to others. Lack of null and negative results in lieu of positive and false positive results may even create fields based on completely non-existent phenomena. And finally, due to reporting bias, reproducibility of results is becoming increasingly problematic. In fact, 70% of researchers report unable to reproduce published results. 
So now I'd like to take a look at a case study on drugs used for the treatment of depression and watch publication bias, outcome reporting bias, spin and citation bias in action. Professor DeVries and colleagues assembled a cohort of 105 placebo randomized control trials for depression from the FDA database. Pharmaceutical companies are required to pre-register all drug trials to obtain FDA approval. So all trials with non-significant results or even unpublished trials are easily accessible. In figure two, column A displays the initial complete cohort of trials, while B through E shows the cumulative effect of biases in play in the body of evidence. The FDA classified approximately 50% of the trials in column A as favorable or positive results in favor of the drugs and 50% as negative or unfavorable. However, as you can see in column E, we only have four unfavorable outcome studies remaining in the literature. How? Well, due to publication bias, almost half of the negative result studies were not published at all. And due to selective reporting bias, omission of unfavorable outcomes and post hoc changes to primary and secondary outcomes, a further 10 negative trials were published with positive results, as you can see in column C. Then the use of spin or misleading language further distorts the perception of negative outcome trials with phrases like a trend for efficacy, providing a distorted interpretation of reality. Finelli cannot corroborates this phenomenon and stated that negative sentences such as non-significant difference have decreased, while catchy expressions such as paradigm shift have increased in the literature. So finally, we're left with four of 77 published trials which explicitly reported that the treatment was not more effective than the placebo, which of course is a bit of a biased conclusion. Compounding the problem, in column E, we see that positive trials were cited three times as frequently, noted by the larger size of the dots, and this further perpetuates these falsehoods. In this case study, the harmful cumulative effect of reporting bias almost eliminated a body of null and negative results for antidepressants from the scientific literature base. So how can this be avoided? Well, Transparency is the most important action to safeguard health research. Pre-study, prospective registration of all clinical trials should be required and encouraged by, for other design, study designs by journal editors, regulators, ethics committees and sponsors to curtail bias and to increase the likelihood of publication. During the study, transparent science practices should be utilized, such as making code and de-identified data publicly available, as this practice aids in reproducing, in, as this practice aids reproducibility, prevents duplication, reduces waste, accelerates innovation by quickly identifying errors, and prevents reporting biases. Post-study, reporting guidelines such as CONSORT can help guide researchers to improve their reporting of randomized trials and the use of other checklists and tools to help assess the risk of reporting biases in studies, including Cochrane Risk of Bias Tool, GRADE and ORBIT2 should be used. So what have we learned? Increased use of meta-analysis and systematic reviews of healthcare interventions has highlighted several types of bias that can arise at all stages of a randomised control trial. Reporting bias has been recognised as a potential threat to validity for meta-analysis and can make the readily available body of evidence unreliable for decision making. Consequently, students, researchers, clinicians and stakeholders across all healthcare disciplines must be diligent, transparent and aware of the potential for reporting bias to distort the treatment efficacy, which threatens the practice of evidence-based medicine. Thank you for watching.